good evening, friends from China. Good afternoon to our audience in Europe. And good morning for those of you who are joining us from our side of the world. We hope that you are all doing really well. Once again, we are delighted, both Katy and myself, to be back with this beautiful audience. It seems that the pandemic continues, but with less severity. And we are cultivating patience because it is our best response to the current times. So let's keep in our hearts, in our minds, the people of Ukraine who continue to suffer, wishing with all our hearts that there will be an end to the aggressions and that there will be peace agreements as soon as possible. We also want to thank again the Global University for Sustainability in Hong Kong for opening up this global space of borderless dialogue, offering us this platform to expand and to scale new levels of transforming consciousness. So our thanks and appreciation always to Dr. Lau King Chi, Dr. Margaret Jade, and the team of interpreters who make our communication possible. Thank you so much. And we would also like to thank the support of our team here in Querétaro, uh, Marcela and Salvador, who are always supporting us with the images, with the technology. So this presentation is the sixth out of seven sessions, trying to explore and to expand the emergence of consciousness as an endogenous and evolutionary process that we have named the 13 moons of the awakening of consciousness. Our intention has been to deepen and to continue learning our Co from our coexistence among the different communities, indigenous communities in Chiapas, especially focused between the 1960s and 1981, when we lived there, we present narratives, philosophy, images, and the reflections that we hope that we will be able to share with you, showing the wisdom of the original peoples, who have their own community ways and who offer us sustainable civilizing models. So far, okay, so this is the sixth session and we've addressed so far different topics. I'm going to mention all of them. First, it was the hidden consciousness of the cosmic connection presented by means of the Mayan archaeology of Chichen Itza, the Tolkien of the Mayan calendar, which are the ones guiding the journey of life. Second, we talked about the cultural consciousness of the community, and we presented the Popol Vuh, the book of the community, uh, the, the old, the ancient community of the Mayans. So understanding then Number three, consciousness of the sacred and obedience of the mandate of the community, linking the I and the we. Fourth, the affirmed consciousness from the cry of the earth, which revealed the utmost importance and the union, the link between human beings, the earth and all beings. Number five, it was the challenged consciousness in the face of new paradigms, where we could consider different contexts that included um, an international and national influence together with the realities of the state of Chiapas. Then number six, consciousness challenging beliefs, where we showed experiences from the catechists as of October 1968 where when their assessment of the missionary work marked the demand for conversion. Number seven was consciousness recreating identity. That's what gave value to the communities, building longings, naming and creating their own identity, their own evolution. Number eight, consciousness seeking freedom exercise in the Exodus catechesis, showing the methodology, the participation in the communities, the creation of their future, 
and then the consciousness of the collective and public exercise of rights, that is to say, expressing the collective will of the communities, which culminated in the Indigenous Congress of 1974. So now, in this sixth meeting, we will focus our attention on the consciousness of our united force for the common good and the consciousness facing the current challenges. So, as usual, we will start by listening to the snail. So, the sacred summoning or the voice that calls all the communities to be gathered in Chiapas. So, let us open ourselves today to start by listening to this attentively. So, let's listen to the sound of the snail. So now, let's start focusing on today's topic, the consciousness of our united strength or force for the common good. It was the dawn on August the 7th, 1974. The 18 Mayan Tetel indigenous people from San Vicente Farm in the municipality of Ocosingo were already lined up flanked by Sebastián, the foreman, who was also an indigenous people. They were facing the large entrance of the farm on the steps, standing, armed. In the center was the owner, and on the left, his wife, both of them with an air of superiority before their servants. It was a time to distribute the day's work. Before they began, Sebastián, with a tone of humility and firmness, told the owner, in a Tetzal influenced Spanish. Patroncito, excuse me, but I would like to show you this paper, which is for you. What's that? When receiving that paper, they saw it was a summon from the Ministry of Labor issued in the capital. Who do you think you are, you illiterate Indian? Nobody does this to me. I'm your boss. I'm the boss. I'm the one in charge here. His wife, standing there, said, Kill him now. You look like an old faggot. Kill that Indian. The boss immediately drew his pistol and shot him in the chest and in the head. That's when Sebastian, the foreman of the farmers, fell dead. After the shots, all the other workers fled. How did it come? that Sebastián, a poor and illiterate man, a humble, uneducated man who had never gone out, could have such a document. Hearing that indigenous meetings were being held in Ocosingo, Sebastián had sought how to find out, and he was referred to the coordinators of the Ocosingo Sub-Congress, to whom he told how they lived in San Vicente Farm for several generations. He had been born himself on the finca, on the farm, and he said that each person received five cents a day for 12 hours of work per day, and that in the last six months, they had not been paid anything. He also said that women, girls, and boys had to serve ear shifts on the big house, of course, without any pay. They had nothing, they suffered from illnesses. The coordinators listened to him, advised him to file a complaint, and advised him to get this document. That's why at dawn, Sebastian presented the summons to the boss without imagining that it was going to cost him his life. 
the bosses of San Vicente, surprised by this act uh, on, on behalf of an indigenous man, reacted with violence, insulted him, and without hesitation killed him in front of his workers. When all his men fled, the boss went to the Ocosingo um, public prosecutor's office to denounce that another Sebastian, the son of the Sebastian that was killed, had tried to rape her. So they de and she demanded his arrest. This Sebastian was detained and placed in jail. It turned out that the next day, the community representatives had been summoned for the Congress in Ocosingo barely two months before the Indigenous Congress in San Cristobal. There were Indigenous Celtalt groups from 180 communities already in Ocosingo for this event. So as the coordinators and the authorities learned about the arrest of Sebastián, the son, gathered and with oil lamps, they formed a group of approximately 20 people and they went to the house of the local judge. They told him, Judge, you have Sebastián from San Vicente imprisoned because of a false accusation. And we want to tell you that you have to give our comrade back to us. We will accompany you. The judge replied, it's not, a time, it's not the office hours right now, so it will be tomorrow. And they replied, no, Mr. Judge, it's time for justice. So it is time for our comrade to be released. We warn you. More people began to gather. The judge was filled with fear, so he left with the caravan. Before the eyes of the soldiers, he removed the padlock, opened the door, and Sebastian was free. The news spread quickly, both in the people from the people in the town, and they said, the Indians will rise up, you will see. The congressmen were overjoyed, saying, Ha'ini hatekitip hatekubsel. That is, look at our united strength. With that, we can live better. This event was registered by all as a resounding achievement, showing the value of the community's strength with its word and with its present, imposing justice before an unjust authority and before the Mestizo people of Ocosingo. For the first time in their history, they were the protagonists in a non-indigenous environment with bearing ethics and justice in mind, manifested by their word and their presence. Los hechos mismos so the events that actually took place in San Vicente Farm were one of the many examples of the subjugated way of life, of the indignity, ab abuse, violence that the Mayan Celtal people continued to live under forms of true slavery, even in the year 1974. In the municipality of Ocosingor, the catechesis of the Exodus we are seeking freedom, had already taken root in 180 indigenous communities. For more than two years, it had been built with a participatory methodology, bringing out their pain, their sorrow, and also their words and their agreements that outlined their future based on faith and hope. In such an experience where everyone was part of it, there was the experience of being subjects of their own lives. And therefore, the word of God was constituted as an integration of the whole. As a matter of fact, the historical watershed, with no doubt, was the Indigenous Congress of 1974, where they asked and answered, Fray Bartolomé is dead. We are not waiting for another Fray Bartolomé, so who will be able to defend us? And the answer was, we are the new Bartolomé. From the 28 agreements emanating from this Congress, responding to the fundamental needs of land, trade, education, and health, many initiatives emerged from different regions. In the communities of Ocosingo, 
there were study meetings that began to began to be held to increase knowledge and to discover the new forms of struggle that would make real those words saying we are the new Bartolome. So now let's talk about the birth of the Kiptik Ta Le Cuptesel organization. On December the 14th, 1975, an organization was called and it was called Kiptik Ta Le Cuptesel. This event took place in the Ejido of San Juan in La Cañada de Patiwitz. This first time, there were 35 ejidos from Ocosingo that joined there. And a few months later, 16 more joined. So let's analyze the etymology, Celtal and Mayan etymology of this name. Quiptic da le cuptesel is derived from or is broken down as follows. Quiptic, Q implies mine, it's a prefix of belonging. Ip implies force or strength, so a reference, a nucleus or core. Tic, our, a suffix indicating plural. And therefore, it's saying like our strength or I in the we. My strength is our strength. So that would be the first part, the first word. And then tale cuptesel, ta is means for lek the good and le coup imp implies the increasing good it's like the nucleus of reference again the cell is in constant motion it means it's a suffix of that reference so le coup de cell would imply for our good which is in constant growth as we can see in the breakdown of this name it has a richness and a depth that can only be understood from the mayan philosophical virtuosity that is that is with meaning by naming you are creating you are giving meaning in this case, when you say Kiptik Tale Kuptesel, we know that it actually means our united strength leading towards our growing community good. And why this name? When we ask about the choice of this name, some of the responses can be seen in these testimonies. What they say, they said to be is to honor ourselves and thus follow the path, which as Mayan Saltal, as it shows us the way to work and gives us the orientation of our destiny. It is to affirm ourselves through our experience, our customs, and our convictions. It is to give ourselves a name in our own language so that we can identify ourselves with the creation of our own organization. People hear and feel the name as their own. It is born from our own language, our own heart, and our own culture. Now we are going to look at the statutes of the Kiptik Tale Kuptesel. A significant fact was that after discussing the reason for the new organization and its purposes, it was formally begun to fill, they formally began to fill out an institutional form. The assembly asked that it was written first by hand and then typed, and first in Celtal and then in Spanish, even though the format guide was in Spanish. They were possessed of themselves and of what was truly being constituted as something of their own. Here we show you one of the documents, a document that shows these statutes. The members of the new organization were also aware that they were embarking on a new path. It was a new adventure and that this required new learning, new languages, and new ways of relating to each other, both internally and externally. 
This is why they said, we are firm. We stand firm in being an organization of indigenous Celtal, Tojolabal, Totsil, and Chol, who need to learn more about organizing in order to improve our lives. In the definition of the objective of the Union of Hijidos Kiptik Tale Kuptesel, it is stated in the second chapter, Article 5. The union will be formed with the aim of seeking the best economic, social, yes. and cultural ways for ensuring the growth of our standards of life. These statutes were legally documented, granting the new organization the right to exercise actions and events in accordance with the object of its creation. This was a step forward, a different step, which gave the Kiptik Talekuptesel a formal character of recognition in terms of the federal law of agrarian reform before the federal, state, and municipal authorities. Now we're going to talk about the organization. The key word for this new phase was exactly that, organization, which corresponded to Kiptik Taleb Kuptesel and differentiated it from the other religious cultural dimension, which before they had named as the word of God. In studying the organization, they defined it like this. They said, the organization is our correct union of works, will, and thought of all the participants in order to achieve what we want or what we seek. They said, in a metaphorical sense, the organization is like a body, a living body, which must work to achieve the best possible life. And in trying to understand the organization, they said that Every organization has three parts, which give it meaning. There is an organizational structure, there is organic life, and there is a thought of their own, of its own. Now we're going to talk about the first part, which is the organic structure. The structure of the organization was defined as democratic, which mainly meant from, with, and for the communities. This concept translated into what they had already established and practiced. Sobel, Snael, Skasesel, Telekin, Kop. This is what we talked about before, meaning that the leaders should gather the ideas of the assembly, organize them, and return them, give them back to the ejidatarios, so that the decisions that come out from them come stem from agreements, thus putting them into practice. In this way, also, they see the rightness of their ideas at work in order to continue learning and deepening their achievements. The organic structure of Kiptik was defined as, follow, as follows. One, in the center, the General Assembly of Delegates. It is the central and main authority of the organization, and it's composed of all the delegates from each one of the communities. Two, the regional assemblies are the authority for each of the reason, regions and are made up of all the delegates from each region. Three, the board of directors is responsible for coordinating and representing the organization. Four, the technical council is responsible for following up on the projects Five, the, the supervisory board is in charge of taking care of the good and honest performance of the work. And six, the regional councils are in charge of coordinating and animating the initiatives of each region. Now, in the organization's thinking, it is the thinking of our work that tells us which is the best way to achieve what we want without a good, fair, and correct work 
thinking or thought, an organization cannot move forward, even if it has good structures in organic life. For good work thinking, we need a good strategy, a good program, according to the needs of the organization. And there, they, we studied, there were days for reflection, and they said, the strategy is the science of management and it tells us what the best way to achieve what we want is the strategy is always based on needs and on possibilities according to what we want by measuring our strengths and the difficulties or opposing forces the degree of education of organization decision making capacity experiences and resources so now we need to talk about, we're going to talk about our strategy. First, they talked about the economic struggle and the economic struggle, the purpose of the economic struggle, is, according to the writing, is to defend and take advantage of our own resources, land, water, forests, animals, air, which are the riches that have been taken from us. At the same time, to defend our archaeological wealth that has been bequeathed to us by our ancestors. It seeks to eliminate exploitation of labor on farms, as well as any form of injustice. It aims to create fair trade where nor the product nor the price is taken away. The corresponding price is taken away, avoiding the elimination of in abusive intermediaries, coyotes. The economic struggle requires us to work in an organized way because unity is strength. Their understanding of the political struggle at that moment was that the basis of political struggle is the exercise of rights. We have lived through a very, and they said, through a very long history of, ha of having our basic rights crushed, our right to life, to health, to education, everything. As citizen, our right to be citizens. And our great political weakness is that those who are in power can abuse us because they take each one of us separately, and mainly because they see us and they treat us in a demeaning way. The political struggle, thus, is unity translated into power. We need to have power in order to exercise it so there can be justice. And our political power as organized people can be seen in our assemblies, in our representatives who act with legitimacy facing the unfair government of the Secretariat of Agrarian Reform or the police or the army. Our representatives must also react against landowners, small, medium, or large, or merchants who exploit our work and resources. There is power in each one of our ejidos, in our areas, in our regions, in all of us together. It is our responsibility to strengthen and to extend this power for the good of all. We need to learn to join strength to make it power, to make it the power of the organized people. The third part was the ideological struggle. The ideological struggle is a struggle of ideas, of what we believe in and follow. We have lived through a centuries-long struggle that has oppressed our own way of thinking. We have been forced to follow ideas that subjugate us, that exploit us, that deny us rights and dignity. I, the ideological struggle requires work, formation, education of thought, of respect, of justice and dignity. The capacity of managing power requires training and study. This is why we have formulated a program to train and educate ourselves and our communities. Here we can see the struggle of ideas. 
which would be, I have money, these ideas that destroy. Sorry, we have ideas that destroy us and the ideas that give us dignity of, and our ideas of our own. So I have money on the one side and on the other side, money is produced by work, by labor. Individual is best on the one hand and mm, community good is the best on the other side. My power is the, my power is democracy, human rights, these belong to the people. Human rights are the essence of struggle. So the action program of the Kiptik was this one. They said, we, the members of Kiptik, as indigenous peasants, we have a practical and active and a result-oriented way of being and acting. We have created a work program in three parts, corresponding to the economic, political, and ideological strategy. So now we're going to look at the economic program first. To them, the economic program was centered at those moments, particularly in the struggle, the fight for land. The struggle for land has been the main focus for the Kiptik Talekuptesel. We realized, they said, that our main enemy has been the government itself. And this is attested to by the assembly minutes, as we see here by way of an example in the Ejido de Acapulco, where it says, we, who sign below, point out that with the problem of breach, work is being done, commissioned by the Constitutional President of the United Mexican States, assisted by the Secretary of Agrarian Reform, the Secretary of National Defense, meaning the Army, the Secretary of Agriculture and Hydraulic Resources, by the state's governor, by the Secretary of Agrarian Reform. It's in the state of Chiapas. It is necessary for us to see what we are going to take as an agreement to defend our right. They said this in January 1979. Uh, sometime before that, in 1971, President Luis Echeverria Alvarez issued a presidential decree that granted 614,021 hectares, this is almost half of the Lacandon jungle, to 66 Lacandon families. This decree did not take into account that there were already 26, 26 communities that were already authorized within this territory, which had their informative technical study, but had not been able to achieve the last step of the agrarian legal process, which is called the presidential resolution. And this happened despite the fact that indigenous people had made, had carried out over 400 difficult and very expensive and fruitless trips to Tuxla, the capital, and some as far as Mexico City, seeking to move forward in this process. The decree also carried the pretext of creating a biosphere reserve, which actually obeyed much more to the interests of the government and certain companies with which there were agreements for the exploitation of large stretches of precious and semi-precious woods within the area as well as other materials in the area. In 1977, Jose Lopez Portillo, while he was president of Mexico, he organized a visit to Chiapas to visit the Lagandon jungle. It was a political act that tried to win over the people who were already very angry and also to justify the erroneous decisions of the degree. 
among the preparations for the visit. In addition to security elements, they looked for a mediator, like a messenger, to measure and to assure the visit would be carried out in a pre-established way with the communities. For this mission, they chose the INI director in Ocosingo, who people trust. When Dr. Mario Rivera arrived as the ambassador of the government to the community, they told him, you, doctor, are good, you are honest, and we're going to keep you here in the jungle. And they kept him in a small jail in the community, and you will stay here until the president himself comes here to solve our problems. While he was detained there, they treated him with special care. They brought him food, coffee, pozole. In the afternoon, they played music for him, and some people would go and talk to him. And when Dr. Rivera did not appear for several days, the federal and state authorities assumed that he had been kidnapped, and they looked and they and they sought out to rescue him. There was a high-level meeting in Taxla Gutierrez at that time at the state capital in order to decide what to do. The governor of Chiapas participated in it, as well as the head of the Chiapas military, the secretary of agrarian reform in Chiapas, and the attorney general of the republic. During the discussion, there was a trend to send military immediately in light aircraft, followed by a military convoy on the ground. This decision was finally discarded, fortunately, and it was the, the attorney general himself who proposed that it was better to negotiate through trust with the indigenous people themselves, looking to establish a dialogue with the commission that would attend directly to their requests. For this meeting, Don Samuel was invited and someone also close to him. In order to reach the decision to, reach, to seek dialogue, they asked for Don Samuel's opinion. This made it possible to carry out an action in which a committee was set up to dialogue with a commission from the communities. And they, meanwhile, in the jungle, the assembly agreed that Dr. Rivera would no longer have to stay. We have decided that you need to leave. We don't want you to defend us. All we ask is that you tell the truth. When the, com when the commission of indigenous authorities arrived in Tuxla, along with Dr. Rivera, they were separated and the government authorities intimidated them, threatened them without resolving the matter. This government betrayed the agreement and the distance became even greater. And the president never made it to the jungle. The organization, the Kiptik organization has spent many years fighting for land, even having to pay with the lives of some leaders who were murdered. Among them, Manuel Saragos, a Celta leader from Bachajón, and Rosario Martinez, a Tzolzil leader and founder of the Emiliano Zapata Ejido, mysteriously murdered in the jungle. Both had been important leaders of the community of the Indigenous Congress in 1974. Now let's see some improvements of the land. About the actions of the Kitik Lakulm itself, some Organic maize cultivations were made, 1 million plants were developed. They had the first experiment of soybean plants to try to improve the proteins. There were courses to create orange trees and to improve or to increase the citrus production. Transportation projects were made in those days, all land and air transportation services were controlled and exploited as big businesses for the mestizos of the town of Ocosingo. And they were imposing their, the times, the terms, the prices. So there was a project first of having their own truck a three-ton truck. 
that was the first economic project of the Kiptik. It was achieved with the economic cooperation of 25 pesos, equivalent to $1.25 US dollars, for each ejidatario from 35 communities. And it was paid for over a period of two years with the partial help of some international aid agencies. So for the first time in the history of the jungle communities, there was a service offered by their own organization. The driver was Tonio, a Tzetzal man who was trusted by the communities. Such was the anger of the mestizos who had controlled the transportation so far that they tried to provoke an accident, putting glass and stones on an uphill in order to stop the truck, and they assaulted Tonya with a knife, tearing his clothes. However, they didn't manage to seriously injure him because some of the passengers realized and went, got off quickly to support Tonya. It was necessary to defend the route, the transport, the security, and so they did. Sometime later, through their own work and transportation business, they managed to get a second truck with another route. There was another project that was the airplane project for the Kiptik region. A project was made to cover the air transportation needs, offering the Kiptik own services. The communities realized that they had 24 airstrips of their own in constant use. And it showed that 70% of all of that was used by the communities itself. And that there was an average of 70 to 90 air trips every week from Ocosingo to Comitán. This project, due to political problems and interests, was not, was not completed. Then there was a construction of new roads and that decreased the demand for air travel. There was another project having a winery, the winery project. It was proposed and achieved and it was mainly used to store the coffee production, which was previously managed and controlled by hoarders who forced uh, the cheap sale of coffee and the loss of quality. This winery marked a big difference in the market because the hoarders could no longer treat them separately, that is to say producer by producer, producer imposing their unfair terms. On the other hand, there was an ideological or, or training formation program. There were Mexican history courses, for example, the revolution, the conquest, the independence, the reform. So a method of information and reflection was used. There were courses on agrarian law. And in those courses, they used a translation of the agrarian law into Tetzal, made by a Jesuit uh, comrade. And the courses emphasized how they could exercise their own rights in, in any discussions they would have with government representatives. Courses on administration with basic elements of how to order, keep, to file, to take care of things. There were courses of analysis and social and political reflection focused on understanding and reflecting on all the learnings and the learnings of their own fights. Then there were cultivation courses for fruit trees, citrus, maize cultivation, corn cultivation. So now we're going to talk about the end of the name Kiptik Talekup Tesel and the beginning of the Arik Union of, of Unions. In 1988, the federal government had a severe blow to the organization, taking away, away the legal validity of the Quiptic Tac Le Cup de Cell. 
they announced that the government had created a new legal figure unifying all the organizations. By decree, all the EGIDO unions would have to use the same name, calling themselves ARIC, which is Rural Association for Collective Interest. With that, all indigenous or peasant unions were subjected to new legal rules, new paperwork. And of course, it was imposed as the single way to actually have access to government resources. With this decree, they tried to eliminate the strength and the social creativity, the sense of community belonging and the indigenous cultural value. So the real aim was to try to achieve greater control and political subjugation of the organizations. It felt like a direct attack on the heart of the organization, like an attempt to tear apart the history and the struggle of the peoples. The story of our experience living with these communities went on until the early 1980s. Then we well, we went to live in Mexico because of our health issue and health reasons of one of our daughters. Through this presentation, we would like to show our fraternal recognition to the ARIC, which experienced enormous difficulties to survive and to continue struggling now in Chiapas. It is important to point out that the Indigenous Congress was a showcase that opened to the world the value and the geopolitical location of the Indigenous organizations in Chiapas, especially the ones in the Lacandon jungle of Ocosingo. That area is important because of its natural resources, its border with Guatemala, its cultural richness. So this attracted various organizations to have an influence there, trying to imprint their own character and their own lines. These organizations managed their political and governmental relations to influence the obtaining of resources. Many organizations were created in Ocosingo and they tried to unify them, responding more to a logic of control than to the indigenous articulation of the indigenous communities. The organization that is currently called ARIC, Union of Unions, has the enormous merit of never being discouraged or never abandoning this cause. The ARIC's organization had a clear idea and conviction of its own autonomy as an inalienable value. However, it began to play with the new advisors without actually understanding the scope of the game where they were getting involved. And that is where they had to pay a very high price for not knowing clearly with whom or what they were playing. The main advantages obtained by the ARIC with the new consultancies were having more formal structures, more aligned with the requirements of the government agencies so as to be able to obtain resources, the association and interconnection with other EGIDO unions in Chiapas. So at a larger scale, maybe operating other projects with other leaders, the creation of alliances for large scale, larger scale actions, being part of productive economic and social volumes and having access to greater relations with the government and with the resources. On the other hand, the disadvantages brought about by these relations were, one, the addict sometimes did not know how to control the implications of these negotiations where they entered in exchange for, for the projects. Two, they ignored the undeclared links between the social organizations and the government projects or the government interests behind that. Three, 
the advisors were allowed to create major contradictions among the Arik leaders, causing deep divisions among the leaders, among the members, and um, within the organization itself. By offering positions of power to the key leaders of the movement, they also increased internal contradictions because resources were negotiated in exchange for, for example, renouncing to the organization's autonomy. So there was a double division of the ADIC that for several years caused them to act in parallel, but in competing actions, wearing out their own potential. So which are the teachings or learnings of this last few years. One, the unity among the EGIDO members has a unique value, which is the key to the success for everyone. Two, that the carelessness of several leaders by means of alcohol destroys everyone. Three, that honesty in managing the resources is essential and that corruption for money is toxic and it can be lethal for that the promises of position of power from the government are dangerous and they become like a cancer that traps you if, if you forget the respect and accountability to the community. However, later on, there was a reunification of the addicts after almost 10 years of being separated and fighting with one another the three different addicts achieved in 2018, yeah, so four years ago, the reunification of all of them. And as they said before, in one single heart, Hunash Kotantik Ayotik. This event implied a work of internal review, internal revision of each addict. So consultation with the communities, dialogues, among leaders until finally reaching the point of origin, which was the agreement, which is synonymous of unity or reconciliation for them. To reach this point, according to their tradition, they prepared an event that contained the key elements for a Tsetsal Maya reconciliation, which are the sacred permission in order to talk to one another, to demonstrate mutual forgiveness, to determine the key points of a new agreement, and to point out what to do and how to manage themselves. It was a historical moment that gave great value to, their, to the meaning that they gave to unity, action, and community well-being. And of course, they had a party where, of course, they slaughtered a cow, everyone was sharing and having the feast, celebrating with dance. So you could see where the minds and the dancing feet of this new generation was being created and was being shown. So now, let's listen to a testimony of one of the colleagues who was a leader of Arik, so let's listen to his own words. Buenas tardes, hermanas y hermanos del mundo. Hello, brothers and sisters from the whole world. My name is Sebastián Jiménez Clara. I'm an indigenous Mayan Seltzal from the Lacandon jungle, and I'm from the Ejido Salvador Allende from Chiapas. The creation of the Kik Tik Tal de Cuptecel was in 1975, and it was what opened up the road ahead to defend our rights for life, to defend our lands, and to defend our territories, to organize ourselves for production and for the commercialization Sobre todo of lo que aprendimos a construir fair prices. Yeah. We learned to defend our autonomy as an indigenous people of Chiapas. After two decades of walking together with a lot of effort, 
our movement got weak and it got divided with other forces coming in and we experienced difficult times even more when the war declaration was created in the Kiptik and when the Zapatism was created. The presence of the government was pressing us by means of war and psychological war to, the, to our people, finding or trying to find corruption and weakening our autonomy. But we had our faith, we had our culture. That was our strength. In 1988, they changed our name. So we became the Arik. They broke our unity. Then we created two Ariks and then another, the third Arik. And we spent many years like that because they wanted to force us to respond to other interests. Finally, we got together again by means of a unity pact or agreement, a reconciliation pact. And that's how our organization currently stands. I'm giving this testimony, I'm sharing this testimony with you, sharing this with all of you, brothers and sisters from the world, to say that unity and strength is what we have to do. I greet you all from Chiapas, the Lacandon jungle. So now our reflection. We would like to express our great admiration to the Arik Union of Unions, which had the humility to recognize mistakes, the courage to face them and overcome them, and the heart to meet again in fraternity, creating through its own actions a new hope. There are a few organizations that achieve such maturity, overcoming the selfishness. This Bernardo Toro, one characteristic of the most important goods in life is that they cannot be accumulated. Love, trust, loyalty, ethics, fidelity. They are not cumulative. These are goods that only exist as long as they are produced. The same is true for democracy. It is not an accumulable good. Democracy is like love. It cannot be imitated. It cannot be imposed. It cannot be decreed. It cannot be bought. It can only be lived if it is built every day. Democracy is not a science. It is not a political party. It is not a religion. It is not a social movement. Democracy is a way of seeing and of building the world. It is a way of being. It is a way of living and being in the world. In short, democracy is a world view. We began five months ago with this series of talks related to the cosmovision of Mayan peoples from their 13 moon calendars and their architecture and also starting with our learning experiences with them. We have observed and we have learned that their cosmovision functions as a virtuous circle that embraces and includes the modern, vital, and updated concepts today. The struggle of indigenous communities is a testimony to their true vocation to build a democratic life, always based on agreements and drawing strength from their deepest roots of Mayan cosmovision with dignity and identity through their constantly evolving consciousness. We want to close now this first part with a, a song that was created in the community of San Juan in the year 1975, one year after the creation of the Kiptik. Today, we continue to value and recover their origin and their spirit that from the beginning, 47 years ago, when they chose to name themselves Kiptip Dale Kuptesel, our strength for our ever-growing life. Delegados llevan voz, la asamblea da la orden al consejo ejecutor. Con 
compañeras, compañeros, compañeros de la unión, sin temor andamos siempre, tip tip dale cúpese, tip tip dale cúpese, juntando los pensamientos, van saliendo los programas, descubriendo todos juntos el poder de la unidad. Nuestra lucha ya es más clara contra toda explotación. Precios justos buscaremos para nuestra producción. Compañeras, compañeros, compañeros de la unión, sin temor andamos siempre. Tip, tip, dale, cúpesel. Compañeras, compañeros, compañeros de la unión, sin temor andamos siempre. Tip, tip, dale, cúpesel. Tip, tip, dale, cúpesel. Tip, tip, dale, cúpesel. Vamos a empezar de nuevo okay. para ti. Going to start. We're going to start with a new paradigm for current challenges. This is something very difficult to resolve. A challenge is defined as something difficult to solve. The dictionary says that to challenge is to contend with something that requires strength, agility, and dexterity. Thus far, we have focused our attention on the evolution of consciousness among indigenous people in Japan with these observations. We have discovered that current observation, that current challenges in Chiapa are real, but they are not only limited to this region nor to that population. These are global challenges that concern us all today. The main challenges that we see to today in Chiapas are gender inequality, migration, rupturas culturales y de valores, cultural ruptures and ruptures in values, drug trafficking and armed violence and ecological destruction. First, we are going to talk a bit about gender inequality. Just like in other societies, almost all of them, gender inequality in Mexico, it's called machismo. It continues to be a priority challenge. Among indigenous peoples, we observe exclusion, lack of opportunities, exploitation of women and girls, and denial of the exercise of human rights on equal grounds with men. Gender is not the same as sex, obviously. Sex has to do with the body that we are born with. Rather, gender refers to roles and activities that are assigned to people because or according to their sex and how relationships are established between them. It is about who does what, who makes the decisions, and who gets those, the benefits. Citing a book that is called School of Leadership and Participation of Indigenous Women by Olivia Hernández Pérez and Maria del Carmen Mendoza, we can hear the voices of some indigenous women from Chiapas. This is what they said. One of them said, the customs of our ancestors, it is to not let the daughters go out alone. They only give permission to the men so that women always can stay at home and without respecting our decisions as women. In our work, we get up very early from four or five in the morning and we rest only at nine or 10 at night. It gives us a lot of courage that there are men who say that we have no rights and that we only are to serve them and not the organization. What we like is women's participation and the way that we dress and our language sometimes we feel as if we were not worth it, but we are worthy. Second challenge, migration. Migration is a very relevant phenomenon for the future of indigenous communities of Chiapas. And it is in fact an enormous challenge at the international level. It really functions as an escape valve from a toxic system 
that exhausts the possibilities of a dignified life. In Chiapas, young people are migrating, looking for employment and looking for greater sources of income out of a desire to see more of the world and, of course, to earn money to help their families. Some of them stay in Mexico, but most seek to cross the northern border, despite how dangerous it is and how dangerous it also is to work as undocumented immigrants living under the radar in the US. Crossing the northern border means putting yourself in the hands of organized crime who control this business and who charge between nine and 10,000 US dollars. A large amount of money is paid before leaving and the rest while working in the US. And when they are there, they are watched, they are controlled until they finish the payment. And if they don't make it, they might be forced to work with the drug traffickers. And sometimes they end up in jail in the US for crossing the border with drugs. It is also worth mentioning that some people migrate because of the increasing influence and intrusion and violence of the narcos themselves, even in the rural areas of Chiapas, and because of the increasing insecurity and the crimes that are unpunished throughout Mexico. The third challenge now that we're going to talk about has to do with the cultural ruptures and the ruptures in values as well with a larger penetration of roads, and particularly with intensive and extensive arrival of digital technology, communities, and particularly youth, they are changing their ideas and their aspirations. They want to experience life that they observe on social media and internet. The dominant global culture also influences the way they dress, the way they speak, and the way that they value their local cultures even though they still speak indigenous languages in their communities, some of the community members, especially if they have lived abroad, they are no longer interested in teaching their languages to their children. The privileged way of deciding within the community, which is the agreement, is still the way to proceed for decisions that concern the community as a whole. However, individualism, is beginning to penetrate. And we see that some people who have had economic advantages have become money lenders within the community and they charge interest at around 20% monthly. The next element is drug trafficking and armed violence. With the rise of globalization and digital technology, the different spheres of influence continue to change. And other interests and other productive and social and political forces have entered Chiapas very strongly. This Chiapas continues to be attractive because of a source, it's a source of wealth and profit to exploit. Sadly, Today in Chiapas, there are seven drug cartels that are operating, and there has been a great proliferation of firearms at their reach. This has sowed a lot of violence and a lot of insecurity in their cities and even in medium sized towns. The last challenge that we're going to mention now is ecological destruction. All the challenges are interconnected, but the challenge of ecological destruction is decisive because it will dictate the future of life on the planet as a whole. A lot of scientists have been saying over decades that climate change is destroying our planet's ability to regenerate. And what is now in doubt is the survival itself of homo sapiens, of our own species, our own species. We are told that human beings who have only been inhabiting the earth for 200,000 years are witnessing today the sixth mass extinction event in the history of our planet. The last one of them happened 65 million years ago. If we think about it, it is very difficult 
to find any human activity that does not directly or indirectly use energy produced by burning fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas. Our civilization has exploited these resources in an irrational and in an unequal way, producing enormous wealth for a few and disease and death for many. It has provided massive mobility and transportation and unprecedented productive achievements. It has created a system of vertical elitist and discriminatory, discriminatory enterprises, while at the same time creating knowledge and social, political, cultural, and technological movements, but all linked in a civilization that is almost totally dependent on the burning of fossil fuels as a source of energy. If this civilization model continues, scientists are saying that we will reach the extinction of 50% of all species existing on Earth today over the next eight decades. This reality is very alarming and the window of opportunity is really very small in time. Jeremy Rifkin, Rifkin. Jeremy Rifkin is a scientist, very highly regarded scholar of these issues, who offers some clues of hope in the face of this challenge. His work over decades of research really give him great authority. He has worked with the European Union, finding practical and vital solutions. Rifkin has studied the two industrial revolutions that have so far occurred in Europe, one of them at the eight of the 18th century, and also in the US at the end of the at the end of the 19th century. And he found that major changes take place when three technological factors coincide. First, when there is a breakthrough in communications technologies, two, when there are uh, developments in new sources of energy, and three, new mobility and logistics. This is why the path of hope set out by Rifkin is extremely important. He says that we already have significant advances in digital technology and communications that would also serve to, that to change the modes or the forms of production. It will change the structures. They will not be vertical, heavy, huge industrial structures that pollute, but we should move to more agile forms of work organized in small nodes that multiply laterally and at scale. And he shows that the new wind technologies and solar technologies are already replacing fossil fuels because they are cheaper and universally accessible. He asserts that the market itself is dictating the shift towards new forms of energy, and these will stop polluting the atmosphere, halting global warming, and counteracting the damage that has already been done. Rifkin proposes that we go from globalization to globalization. So we continue being global, but acting from the local. This will change the economic model because it will minimize the marginal costs of companies because of the cheapness of technology and also because it will erase the dependence on burning fossil fuels for the transportation of products and people. Rifkin proposes that the current mode of transactional markets will be superseded to such a degree that market capitalism will no longer have the capacity of creating profit, getting profit out of it. So he proposes that we go from markets to networks, from transactions to flows, from buyers and sellers to suppliers and users, from the gross domestic product to quality of life, from productivity 
to regenerativity and from externalities to circularity. So those are important changes. Furthermore, these changes will lead us towards a new economic system, which will be shared in the concept of, of will be based on the concept of sharing. Rifkin, for example, gives uh, the example of the universal access to Wikipedia that offers free and broad knowledge for those who wants, want to conduct any kind of research. The urgency is imminent. Rifkin predicts that the collapse of the civilizational model based on burning of fossil fuels will come before the end of this decade and that the conditions are set so that we can, and that there are experiences already in place so that solar and wind energies that are already being used on a massive scale can become larger. They will be cheaper, they are more sustainable. And for example, electric vehicles will be more accessible by 2028, bringing an exponential curve of growth and of implementation of the creation of a new ecological paradigm of civilization. Rifkin worked with Chancellor Angela Merkel throughout her 16 years as Germany's leader in restructuring the country's economy. Merkel is a chemist and a physicist, and she was named uh, one of the world's most powerful women for her unparalleled achievements in moving Germany towards the demands of ecological sustainability as a civilizational paradigm. The results obtained in Germany confirm the studies that show that when a change of 14% of the productive forces has been achieved, those who understand and practice change with results, the change starts and cannot be stopped. So, in the face of this, let's go to the following reflection. The challenges mentioned from the experience in Chiapas, that is to say ecological destruction, gender inequality, migration, the rupture of culture and of values, drug trafficking, armed violence, all those challenges are interconnected and they are part of the challenges that are currently at a world level. Chaos surrounds us, chaos abounds. Chaos and the apparent violence in nature not only produce extinction, destruction, but they are necessary for the emergence of a new creative order. They are necessary for the evolutionary leaps that we need. Within the old paradigm, chaos was considered to be, and it is still considered to be bad, disruptive, dangerous, because it threatens the status quo of our patriarchal system, which is a system of a lot of order, but not so much equality, far from reality and far from the needs of people and of the planet. So the important challenge that we have ahead of us now is to realize and to accept that chaos is normative in the universe, because by means of destruction, life can be redesigned. Out of chaos, emerge the possibilities of something new. If we learn to embrace chaos instead of rejecting it as something evil, we might find out that the spell can be broken like that and that the universe itself has the power to transform itself, to heal itself. And so do we, as we are part of that same system. We find throughout our lives that there is violence and evil in nature and in human beings. Real evil in human beings arises from our choices. 
and it can be destructive of our relationships with others, with other people, other societies, and with nature. Evil in human beings goes against the evolution of Earth, of Earth and it results in systemic violence that threatens life and leads to murder and to war. The threat of war today can actually end human life on the entire planet. Evil. What is evil? Evil is a growing dysfunctionality in personal and social life that seeks selfishness, individual interests above all others. Evil is the excess of accumulative abundance, whether it is in food, land, power, knowledge, always in the hands of a few, without any benefit for the community or for the collective. Evil is the idolatry of the individual, of the pure race, of the empire that dominates as narcissism, where the rest, the others, are used as a function of subjugation. Evil is the domination of one sex over the other, excluding and marginalizing women and exploiting their bodies and their work, denying the exercise of their human rights. Evil is the domination and the irrational and excessive exploitation of the earth, violating and denying its capacity to generate regenerate itself. Evil is the imposition of religious beliefs or the assertion that some have the rights to eradicate other people's beliefs as an attribute of superiority. That's evil. We are always invited to transcend, that is to say, to go back to our roots, to be in communion with the earth, with the people, and with all human beings, with all living beings, recognizing that transcendence is not a reality far away from us. It inhabits us, it lives within us, it exists between us, with the earth, and with the entire cosmos. This transcendence invites us to respond to a call, to a summon, to live with different ethical behaviors, based on protecting and favoring life at all times. So our question is, which is the new ethics? The new ethic is the care paradigm. Care, caring for ourselves, caring for the planet, caring for everything. And as Bernardo Toro says, caring today is not an option. Either we learn to care, or we will all perish. And Leonardo Boff says, when we love, we care. When we care, we love. Care constitutes the central category of the new paradigm of civilization that is trying to emerge throughout the universe. Care takes a double function of preventing future harm and regenerating past harms. So now we have another song in order to wrap up this this part of consciousness in the face of current challenges. We will be singing in Tetzal and it's we offer this song as a spiritual reflection, as a cry for clarity to the divine higher self and gives a framework to the attitude that we need in order to reach enlightenment, which is humility. So this song was composed between 1970 and 1972 in the Lacandon jungle. Mm -hmm. Cajual 
Chitres, one had conti. A woti con, a woti la, la colta yon, la na el picon, a woti con, yo digna el pi. Tulante sa cotan picon, manchu pequen, cotan picon, manchu pequen, cotan As you can see and what we've heard, it, the lyrics read, creator, maker of everything and maker of us, give us enlightenment for our spirit, come help us to understand, give us now the knowledge, fortify our hearts as we have a humble heart. So now, let's see what we've learned today, together what, what, with what we've learned before. The first facet of the diamond that we worked on in this session was consciousness of our united strength for the common good. Organization is the greatest wealth of a people. Kiptik tale kuptesel is a cosmovision of the organizational democracy. This facet of the diamond of consciousness also faces today's challenges by positioning itself with the vision of a different paradigm, the paradigm of care. Thank you all so much. Thank you indeed for your attention. Thank you for joining us today as well. And now we still have 20 minutes more so that we can receive some comments or uh, Q&A questions I, either through the interpreters or in Spanish directly if there are any. So we can move ahead to the Q&A if you wish. Yes, and uh, okay. we have several questions um, uh, in the chat room. And uh, the question one, thanks to the speakers for your illuminating lecture, what happened eventually to the uh, government degree to give half the land in the Lakadongian uh, jungle to a few thousand uh, families. Did this cause eviction of some communities? Uh, question two, was the church on the side of the communities in fighting for land? Was this issue addressed later by the Zapatistas? Um, question three, what is the impact of climate change on the indigenous communities on their livelihood and pattern of farming. Uh, question four, there are many images of women in your presentation. Could you tell us more about women leadership in Chapa's communities? Uh, one more question. Apart from narco uh, traffickers, paramilitary and uh, local bullies, were there any major impacts from transnational companies in the looting of resources in Chapas. Okay, then I will start by answering the first question. The 
this government decree, this terrible decree that took away half of the of the jungle. So imagine that they were drawing like a square on the map and they said, this part is going to be a reserve of the biosphere. But when they did so, they ignored the fact that there were already 26 communities there with the right, I mean, the permit part of their agrarian reform project was done there. So given that to only 66 families, because the tribe of Lacandonians are an ethnia, but they are in extinction. I think that now they have no more than 200 members, no more than that, because they've always married with one another and they are disappearing. So they live in the jungle, but they are not, I mean, they're quite uh, few. So the problems of the government, the corruption problems, created, I mean, this reserve, this biosphere reserve was created. There were a lot of forests, there were beautiful wood. What's the name of that? Caoba. It's a kind of wood and it was so huge. There was a lot of caoba wood there. And mixing this with another, the, the other question, the international companies that wanted to exploit that wood, well, they received the permit from the government to go into the road. I mean, they had to build the road so that they could reach the jungle and get the wood. But you know that the road went from one density to another density of these caoba trees or these mahogany trees. So they, they were not respecting the interests of the indigenous people at all. So there was quite a struggle between these uh, international companies plus the political interests. And all of that removed, ended up in the removal of, of a lot of wood from the jungle the years after that, that decree, I mean, because it was just, yeah, uh, taking benefit from the richness of that area. As a matter of fact, we know in the Santa Elena community, one of our comrades, our friends there, he sent us a table, a small table, and he said that it was the last caoba tree or mahogany tree in the region. And it is tragic, it is a tragedy because it was an area with so much wood, so much wood with mahogany wood. It's beautiful indeed. And, and there were trees that were, I don't know, um, large, large enough, big enough that even five people trying to surround the trunk could not actually get all the diameter. But this was removed year after year for many years. So this is the response to two questions. On the one hand, what did that 50% of the Lagandon jungle mean? It meant political interest that had to do with the control of natural resources and control and containment of the population, which was also contradictory because the government itself opened the doors in the times of Echeverria and before so that the jungle was populated. Once they left, they generated all these agrarian procedures so on the one hand, it's contradictory because they of the land, second, because they wanted to contain the land, 600,000 hectares for particular private interest. And as a pretext, they said that the Saltal, Sotzil and Chol indigenous peoples were predators for the land, of the land, of the jungle. Of course, they opened up areas for sowing their corn. But of course, much more predators were the other types of exploitation, the exploitation of companies, companies that had interest there. So once, as Kathy mentioned before, mahogany, mahogany wood companies, there were agreements, signed agreements between new companies 
where the government and these foreign companies were partners, having an institution such as that allied them both. And of course, the government had most of the interest. And they had, as uh, as a carer of the Lagandon jungle, it was a man that had been the most important exploiter all over Chiapas of the jungle and of the wood. Second uh, industry, a very big one, was the exploitation of rubber trees. Indigenous people get on these big trees and they, with a machete, they cut, cut, cut. And then there is like a, 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 a channel that is made and blocks like like as if they were building blocks or or they dried them and they exported them mainly to japan and other countries of europe and this was done in with a very difficult uh, work third industry where companies had a lot to do the flowers of camedor they there were trucks full of these flowers that then were put on boats, on ships, and they went mainly to Japan for the production of, I don't know what, but mainly some medicine. That is what is said. They also exploited natural resources, a true pillage of all archaeological, sorry, archaeological resources were completely pillaged many different archaeological sites that have been ravaged and also labor. Right? So there are many economic interests. There were and there are and also political interests. Why? Because this is a frontier. This is the border with Guatemala where there's a lot of goods and relationships that cross from one side to the other. So this border area was particularly of great political and economic interest. Question number three. Question, sorry. Question number two, was the church on the side of the communities fighting for their land? And was this issue addressed later by the Zapatistas or not? I don't think that one thing contradicts the other. The work that the church started, it, it was started in 1960 and it followed the historic process of the communities. And when population phenomenon took place, well, then we went with them to populate the jungle and to fight with them on their agrarian issues. Zapatismo had not appeared then. And when Zapatismo did appear, their emphasis is not, of course, that they don't defend land. They do defend land, of course, but their struggle was much, was much more directly political and it oriented in that sense. But these are not contradictory. That is question number two. Question number three we mentioned a bit just now in terms of the interests of other companies about the question where women appear uh the question about the images of women that appear in our presentation well first of all a lot of women appear because our artists the artists that help us are able to capture the best images and of course women are much more beautiful and elegant and precious than men But machismo and inequality, gender inequality, is continues in Chiapas. It is very important, as it is all over the world, where we, all over the place, we see societies that have a lot of limitations in relation to gender, and women are limited in their participation. Although this, there have been improvements in this sense, of course, there were several attempts for many years to have much, for women to have much more participation in communities, in the assemblies, in the different positions of power and decision-making within organizations. However, just like in all over the world, masculine, domination is still rampant. There are more men in leadership positions in decision-making positions among the indigenous peoples, just like there is more male leadership in all over the world. This is a huge challenge for humanity as at large. 
I believe that within the indigenous communities of Chiapas, they are moving forward, but we're still there still is a deficit in relation to the new agreements that must take place between men and women in order to create a more equal society. We need more consciousness and a new way of understanding roles, not the established roles, because they have in the way that they have been established until now, it is not very likely that women are going to be able to travel to several, to long distance meetings and stay there for several days. Because as I say, who's going to take care of the children? Who's going to take care of the alalitek as we call them? So there is an inequality here and we recognize this. The images do not correspond to the proportion of women's participation, although there are some of them that are absolutely Right, what we once invited a woman to participate in a, in a conference on the cosmovision of women, indigenous women, and her poems are fantastic. This is an event that took place in Oaxaca. I don't remember what year it was, but I think it was at the beginning of the 80s. And we brought women from Chiapas, from Guatemala, and some from other parts of the world to talk about the uh, about their cosmo vision and their struggle as women. And yes, there have been developments made. There was a Mayan priest, female priest, who celebrated several events that we had. And the meeting was two or three days long in Oaxaca. And it was wonderful. And it was an opportunity so that they could offer their, capac their capacities and show their leadership, but there still is work to be done. Indigenous women and their cosmovision in January 1996. That is a comment that was made in the chat room. It is the last comment. It says indigenous women and the cosmovision in January 1996. Now, narco traffickers. Well, there is a huge impact of narco trafficking. It is modifying life conditions in Chiapas very quickly, as we showed before. At this moment, there are seven cartels, narco cartels in Chiapas. And there is also a struggle over territories. And that's why there are murders and crazy things, horrible things, because this is developing. And on the other hand, last week, there was a strong demand to the state's govern governor to say, where is the presence of the state? Where is the presence of the state? So that it, if there is a four hour confrontation between narcos in the city of within the state and the police never appeared. But the police does go to communities when communities are struggling for their rights. Anything else to say? Well, I believe that narco trafficking is a problem all over Mexico. The influence of weapons, because with the border with the US, everybody knows, of course, military weapons are for sale here with all the massacres and murders in schools in the US. They are fighting to have better laws that can control the proliferation of weapons, of military weapons that are available to people and that many times fall into the hands of people who have a lot of problems, a lot of personal difficulties, and God knows what happens with them, but there have been horrible things of mass, mass murders, mass shootings, and these weapons can cross the border to Mexico very easily. There are people who say that narco traffickers in Mexico have equal or even better weapons than the Mexican army. We have two more questions uh, to respond here in the chat. One of them says, 
Uh, what is the most important spiritual tradition that is still practiced by communities in Trappers today? That's the last question. And now yes. we have uh, over 1,000 and uh, one, we have uh, over 1,100 uh, audience on Billy Billy. Several. No, we have two minutes. No, no, we have 100. Ah, maravilloso. Muy wonderful. Bien. That's okay. wonderful. several oh excuse me <laughs> in chiapas I... okay. in chiapas there are different celebrations that have to do with the spiritual world the celebrations in chiapas um, in in as opposed to the mestizo world they join together they unify agriculture with social aspects and religious aspects it's a unity they don't do a separation of all these different realms so there are celebrations spiritual celebrations for crops for different saints there are spiritual celebrations for the festivities that are traditional there are also traditional celebrations so if the question is do these celebrations continue yes they do continue they are much and and there is also an integration of the Mayan practices, of their traditions, their cosmovision, Mayan cosmovision, and also mixed or integrated also with many aspects of Christianity, which are also part of, of, of it because the word of God was very important in the communities. And this is also very much in force. So it's both. It's a combination of both, which is very respectful and very beautiful.